As Harbourview continued to grow and prosper, crowded and hectic conditions of city life led many residents to build and buy homes in what were once small and lonesome farming communities outside of west coast port cities such as Harbourview. When these residents of the city arrived at places like halfway there, many took it on blind faith that their removal from Harbourview kept them safe from the Pandora's box of the dangers and downsides to urban dwelling in the early 20th century. They were soon made to reckon with this, that outskirts have nightmares too. At halfway there, in the late, late summer of 1914, those nightmares, both imagined and real, very often emerged from the old Delaney Swamp. The thick forest of trees and brush and swampy wetland at the foot of cliffs along which Delaney Road runs through our story of Gaumonts and Pembrokes. However, on this particular day, the swamp is no longer the setting of mere folklore. It is the location of a murder. For you see, even here, at halfway there, on Delaney Road, the city intrudes. Annex, the continuing story of a peculiar bend in the avenue. Traffic goes north, traffic goes south. The streetcar runs between. And all we can do is try to keep up. Your name, sir. Last name first, if you would. Dawson. Thomas Dawson. Most call me Tom. I'm, I'm really not much of a Thomas. Age? 40 years old this past March. And where do you reside? On Delaney Road, near halfway there. Above the swamp, of course. Just across the street from the, uh, the Pembrokes. Indeed. We'll get to them soon enough. The Pembrokes. Employed? In what line are you? I'm a newsman. Editor for the Looking Glass newspaper. Every city has to have one. Ah, yes. The Crusading Looking Glass. Dawson, I believe I've read some of your paper's investigative pieces on our police department. You don't like police very well, do you, Mr. Dawson? I like you fine, Detective Riley. And I truly hope you solve this case. Now, what I don't like is the corruption that runs this city, and I mean to use the tools of my trade and the power of the press to save the city of Harborview. Our children deserve as much. Promise me I won't end up in the paper and we'll call it a truce. Married man? Family? <sighs> Nancy. I have, I have a daughter, Nancy Beth. She's 14. Well, 15. Her mother died two years ago. We moved to the new house to halfway there to start over. Get away from the memories. Escape from the city. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not sure Nancy's any safer out here than she was closer in to Harborview. That illusion was shattered for me when I heard Nancy Beth come in the back door screaming like a banshee the way she did the night her mother died. Mr. Dawson, what... Tom. Please. Tom. What had upset your daughter so? She was screaming. Screaming that she's dead and he killed her. Who? Who was dead and who killed her? Nancy told me that Sophie Pembroke was dead and that the Reverend Gaumont had killed her. Death has come to Delaney Avenue. But not for Henry and Jane Pembroke as the Reverend Gaumont had intended and as Otto Stabansky had been instructed. Instead, an innocent has met a suspicious demise in the swamp region below Delaney Road, down below the Gaumont Farm and the Pembroke Lilac Sanctuary, a wild region up against ostensible society. For those who come to halfway there in search of sanctuary from the sins of the city, the death of Sophie Pembroke and the implication of the Reverend Gaumont should have us all anticipating what the witness, 15-year-old Nancy Dawson, has to say. May I have your full name for the record? 
Nancy Elizabeth Dawson. Elizabeth was my mother's name. Nancy, how old are you? I'm 15 years old. Murder has been done in my backyard and a killer roams free. Aces. What does my age have to do with what that man did to Sophie? Miss Dawson, I require a clear narrative so that I might investigate what did happen to Sophie Pembroke and take any action needed. Please tell me what happened. Tell me what you saw in the swamp this afternoon. I'm a writer. Pardon? I'm a writer. I write short stories and nonfiction pieces. I wrote a neighborhood news column, but that's done, and that's why I had rejection-based writer's block. A killer case of writer's block, you see. I'm afraid, Miss Dawson, that... That's the thing, detective. I had writer's block, and that's why I was walking the trail below the cliffs down below. You see, I typically avoid the swamp region and those trails. The dark places. There's no reason for decent people to be down there. It's a netherworld. I needed to walk, though, and I needed quiet, and the streetcar startles me out of my thoughts, and I thought the solitude might help me gather them. What time did you go down there, do you remember? Just short of noon. It really was a most delightful journey. No degenerates or lurkers, as I'd been warned. I'd worked my way along the base of the cliffs and was just below them, and thinking of turning back to return home, when I heard someone up above. Someone crying and screaming and pleading for her life. I didn't know who it was. I didn't know it was Sophie Pembroke. I didn't know that until she kept screaming at someone to get away, to not hurt her, to leave her alone. Who was she shouting at? Did you see any of the altercation? No, I heard only the raised voices, enough to make me stop and look up to the cliffs to see what was about. That's when I heard that scream. That's when Sophie fell. Were you well acquainted with Sophie Pembroke? School chums and the like? Sophie and I? No, she didn't go to school here. She went somewhere else, a private school. She was visiting her parents, she and her sister Diana, but Diana, she left and got married. Sophie kept to herself, and I'd noticed her taking walks alone, emerging from the swamp region and the trails. She said she felt closer to Diana there. I think she missed her sister very much. How close were you to Miss Pembroke? I thought I just told you. When she fell, did she land anywhere close by? You want to know what I saw after. She landed at some distance. I went to her. I wanted to help. I thought I could help. She didn't say anything, if that's what you want to know. She made this terrible crying sound, this frightened animal sound, and I held her in my arms and she died. And that's when he appeared. Her murderer. The man who pushed her. Who was that man? Did you recognize him? It was the fiend, the one and only Reverend Gomont. He appeared nearby and beckoned to me. Come now, my dear, he said to me, stretching out his hand as he must have to Sophie. And then? And then I ran home screaming for help and found my father. What else was I to do? Father summoned the police and here we are. You and I. How are the Pembrokes, her parents? They've been notified. They're trying to get in contact with Diana to inform her of her sister's tragic death. Her sister's tragic murder. For the moment, Miss Dawson, Sophie Pembroke's death is being classified as an accident. Misadventure. And you believe that, detective? For now. Until I see reason to believe otherwise. I understand. Do you truly believe that Sophie Pembroke was pushed from the cliffs? That I do. And who do you believe, based on your observations at the scene, sent Sophie from the cliff to her doom? The Reverend Gaumont. The Reverend Gaumont murdered Sophie Pembroke. Reverend Gaumont's vendetta against the Pembrokes has led to bloodshed. That of Sophie Pembroke dead after falling from the cliffs along Delaney Road. Is our witness, Nancy Dawson, correct that the Reverend Gaumont is responsible for Sophie's fall? And how did young Miss Sophie end up dead in lieu of her parents, whose death the Reverend had ordered shortly before? Pursue answers in the next episode of Annex. Annex.